because most of the mercury research relating uh, mercury exposure to Alzheimer's disease was done at the University of Kentucky. Uh, and that's where I'm, was, I was located. And some of that work had been done before I came there. There were two people, major researchers, Dr. Bill Marksbury, who is an, uh, a neurologist that ran the Aging Center and the Center for Alzheimer's Research, and a Dr. Bill Lehman, who's a very good chemist who measured uh, the metals in uh, moon rocks. And so they decided to get together and look at analyzing AD brain, in a, uh, I mean, comparing tissues from Alzheimer's disease patients to normal patients to see if there were any uh, metals that were uh, involved, that were abnormal. And they did this primarily because there was a report out at that time that aluminum was the cause of Alzheimer's disease. But what they found, and they published several articles on this, that there was an increase, the only significant increase or uh, variation that they could find in AD brain tissue and other tissues, the hypothalamus and uh, the pituitary gland, was mercury. And they published that in several papers. That mercury was the one thing that was out. And you know, when you think about it, mercury's neurotoxic, made all the sense in the world. And I came in and I had a graduate student that went to work in the aging center after she got her PhD and wanted to look at uh, uh, AD brain. And I had a technology that would allow you to look at the biochemical abnormalities that might appear with regard to what are called nucleotide binding proteins. And so we did a study uh, showing that uh, there were differences in the tubulin, the major protein in the brain. It's 80% dysfunctional in Alzheimer's disease samples versus normal. Creatine kinase was another enzyme, a very critical enzyme was 97% inhibited in AD patients versus normal. And then a, an enzyme called glutamine synthetase, dramatically affected in AD brain, which accounted for the fact that you have this toxic glutamate buildup, like monosodium glutamate's neurotoxic. Glutamate high levels can be toxic. This enzyme uh, metabolized, took glutamate and converted it to a non-toxic amino acid. So we started looking at that data and what we found was that indeed these three enzymes were dramatically inhibited in AD brain. And then what's the next study? Since AD is not genetically inherited, we started screening heavy metals or toxic metals, some of them essential metals actually, to see if any of them had an effect. And it just jumped out, I mean, uh, so clean that mercury and only mercury at very low concentration inhibited these enzymes. You could add it to a normal brain homogenate and you would get those same enzymes inhibited because they had very reactive sulfurs in their active sites. Makes all the sense in the world biochemically. The uh, research was then followed up by uh, people at the University of Calgary. We did some research with them, you know, with uh, rats exposed to mercury vapor. Same result. You breathe mercury, you'll get an AD-like brain. If you then go to uh, uh, the neurons and culture, this was published at the University of Calgary. If you added uh, mercury, and only mercury would cause the tubulin, which is one of the major proteins we saw, to dispense off of the neurofibrillary tangles and abnormally aggregate and expose neurofibrillary tangles, which are the major diagnostic hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. So you had all time, and only mercury would do that. Other metals wouldn't do it, and it would do it at 10 to the minus 10th molar which is a lot lower than what they found in the brains of these AD patients. So this was piling up evidence that was, I think, very embarrassing to the uh, American Dental Association and the National Institutes of Dental Research that this was happening. So they had a dentist, a Saxe, Sachs, at the University of Kentucky proposed with Bill Marksbury, who was the person that really you would give credit to for showing that mercury was involved in exacerbating at least Alzheimer's disease. And they got a big NIH grant and they did some research uh, looking at uh, uh, you know, the amalgam history of these people, which only the dentist knew about, and the amount of mercury in the body and the correlation to Alzheimer's disease. And they performed some research. There's a lot of internal consternation about that study. One of the students, the graduate student that measured the mercury level, is not uh, favorably disposed, even though he's mentioned on the paper, was not consulted with the paper before it was published, and is very, uh, very much in disagreement with what they concluded. But the bottom line is, 
the paper proved nothing. The paper, what the paper said, we couldn't find any significant differences on people with, with and without amalgams on mercury level. The only paper that's ever been reported that says mercury body burden doesn't go up with increased amalgam fillings was the Sachs paper. Right. Then they put in what's called a Bonferroni manipulation. And everybody knows this, that knows statistics, knows this is a trick. If you don't want to find a significance, then base what you're looking at, like, like don't just look at mercury in the AD brain versus the control and compare those two. No, look at mercury, copper, zinc, cadmium, everything down the line. And then you have to have a larger difference to say it's significant. And what they found, there was no significance. And they used, a, uh, it, it's a statistical, uh, uh, it, it wouldn't call it a manipulation. I mean, it's, it's used. I mean, it's something that's standard and it's verified in certain cases. But the danger of using a Bonferroni analysis is that if you're looking at multiple factors, multiple things like different metal ions, you, you're very likely to overlook a significant difference in one. And I think that's the reason they did that. Right away you say this, there's something wrong with this. The other thing was is that in the pituitary glands of these people, the controls had double the mercury level of the AD and they just dismiss that. What, how can you possibly find that? How, it's almost as if you pick controls with more amalgam fillings, existing amalgam fillings, than before because why would they have double the mercury level? To make a long story short though, Dr. Marksbury uh, was, uh, from what I understand, uh, wasn't available because during most of the, the uh, aspects of this uh, study because he was out of state getting surgery for a, a medical problem he had. But that makes no difference. He, he had his name on the paper. And that paper, when it went out, showed nothing. I mean, it, it, the data was not significant. In other words, uh, it was so uh, poorly managed and collected. There was no correlation between, for example, mercury in the brain and the number of amalgam fillings. That's the only paper in the world that's ever been published saying there's no correlation between mercury in your body tissues and amalgam fillings. So it indicated that something was really amiss. The paper was submitted to the New England Journal of Medicine and rejected. It was submitted to the uh, 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 Journal of the American Medical Association, or the New England Journal and the American Medical Association Journal, JAMA, and was rejected again, twice. And then it was reported, published in the Journal of the American Dental Association, which is not a referee journal, which is a journal that has, you know, a, a membership that is totally biased against amalgams causing any significant illness. They don't even have the proper uh, review board to look at it because this was on uh, toxicology and neurology. Dental journals don't cover that. So why was it published there? Not only was it published there, but they had a press conference and they put it out and everywhere saying this paper, they, the paper made, uh, was very uh, correct and said we couldn't find any significant correlations between anything. It was a, what you do usually say, well then why are you reporting it? But then when they published it in the Journal of the American Dental Association, they then put out all these press releases saying this proves that Alzheimer's disease isn't caused by amalgams. There's no correlation between mercury exposure and Alzheimer's. Paper didn't prove that at all. Read the paper. I mean, it's a, it's a paper that has no conclusions that are significant at all because the measurements were so poorly done, in my opinion, and so poorly correlated. The major one being the, uh, if you say that there's no correlation between amalgam fillings and retention of mercury in the human body, which everyone else finds on cadavers, that that data on the dental exposure to amalgam was uh, somehow uh, either manipulated or so very poorly designed that it, uh, it destroyed any correlation that you would find in that data. That paper proves absolutely nothing, but it is used as if it does and quoted as if it does. And they would never stand up under any scientific panel based on the fact that, you know, prove that I can say that major medical journals didn't want to touch it. Amalgam fillings put off mercury vapor at a very high rate. And they couldn't correlate somebody, and, and one of them, uh, Dr. Weckstein one time said, what we found is that people with 15 amalgam, a mouthful of amalgams didn't have any more mercury in their brain than people with none. He made that in a newspaper 
article. I mean, the speculation and things they said in the newspaper release was not backed up by what was published in the paper. And not only that, it was goofiness. Everyone uh, that has looked at cadavers with increasing amalgam fillings have found increasing mercury in the brain, liver, and kidney of these patients. So they're the only ones that found out that it didn't happen. And that means that they're the odd man out and that their work is very, very questionable. They certainly didn't want to quote my paper showing that mercury caused, you know, the biochemical aberration. So they've never, they've never looked at my paper, my papers on this area. They've not looked at Dr. Lorscheider's papers. They've not looked at the papers of Drosch and those people in Germany that found elevated mercury in the blood of Alzheimer's patients indicating that. Why do they lean all the way over on the fact that mercury is not involved? And I think the problem you have here is that there's a bias. The Alzheimer's uh, Journal and the Alzheimer's Association has on this board of medical doctors who want to treat Alzheimer's patients, people who are involved in making drugs. If you find out that the real cause of this dementia is something put in your body, in your mouth, inches from your brain that's a very known potent uh, mercury, neuro, I mean neurotoxin such as mercury, you, you, you're not going to make any money off of it. You're not going to make any money selling it. I mean, people uh, who don't want to get Alzheimer's disease just don't get amalgam fillings and, and decrease uh, your uh, intake of uh, mercury-containing vaccines you probably won't become demented with Alzheimer's disease. But there's no money to be made from the pharmaceutical industry in this regard, and that seems to be the driving force. And I would say I don't know what happened with the Alzheimer's Association for them to put that board, that paper on their uh, website and leave off the papers that show the opposite effect, which are many more and from many different universities and directed by people who know something about toxicology not a dentist, because Sachs was the major driver. He kept all the data. He was the dentist at the University of Kentucky in the dental school. He had his, uh, I mean, you have to look up his publication rate. He, he was not known as someone who, he had, that was the, the first and only NIH grant that I think he ever was involved with. Anytime, if you get an NIH grant, I've had lots of NIH grants and lots of money. That, if I collect data and I do experiments and my lab books are there, if somebody wants to know the details of my research, I am almost obligated to provide that to NIH to give to anybody that wants it. I mean, if they wanted to go check out, you know, the fact that I found mercury was toxic to brain tubulin, which is exactly what the AD brain looks like, the tubulin is dysfunctional. Uh, they, I, I would have to, uh, I would have had to give them that data and I would have been very willing to give them that data the raw data so they could look at it and see if I faked it or not. I, I mean, I still have it, I think, so if they want my, my books, I think I could get them to them, but not, I think it's too easy to reproduce. I don't think they're concerned because uh, it's well known that the tubulin is toxic. Uh, I mean, mercury is toxic to tubulin. But revert that back. Well, I don't know that their data was ever available. I don't know, uh, uh, but I, I have to tell you, I didn't ask for it because I didn't want to go over it, but uh, the people who turned it, the data into him were not given the data, you know, the raw data in the paper uh, to show that uh, indeed this was the way it turned out. I mean, the um, graduate student wasn't even uh, allowed to read the paper before it was submitted. Uh, and, you know, and again, publishing something in a trade journal. The Journal of the American Dental Association is a trade journal. It advertises toothpaste. And so it's totally different than the Journal of the American Medical Association. That journal is, is uh, you know, has a, a review board. It takes no advertisement money and uh, uh, that I know of. But, uh, and it doesn't allow you to advertise, you know, your best uh, uh, surgical procedures or something. You can't advertise that. The uh, Journal of the American Dental Association is a trade journal. It sells things to dentists. It's what it's used at. Totally different uh, level of magazine. It's not, it's not considered a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, and certainly you wouldn't publish a neurological paper in the dental journal.